Opinions expressed herein are subject to change and not necessarily the opinion of the firm. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The information presented herein is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide personal investment advice. It is important that you consider your tolerance for risk and investment goals when making investment decisions. Investing in securities does involve risk and the potential of losing money. The material does not constitute research, investment advice, or trade recommendations. And now introducing Mr. Keith Lanton. All right. Good morning again. May 18th, mid-May. Uh, starting to really turn into uh, spring, so I uh, hope everyone's staying healthy and uh, starting to enjoy uh, better weather in the uh, states that uh, have a winter. So a lot to talk about this morning. We're looking at futures up a lot this morning. A lot of work for us to do in terms of uh, managing portfolios, whether we are... Uh, whether we're investors or if we are uh, advisors, lots of uh, moving pieces at this time, lots of uh, lots of opportunity, lots of challenges, and we're going to talk about uh, some of both uh, this morning. I'm uh, going to start out this morning, talk about some of the uh, changes to the laws that uh, that we've heard about, but uh, provide a summary. Uh, we had this the Secure Act, um, which took place before the pandemic, and then we had the CARES Act during the pandemic. Um, these two acts uh, made a uh, perhaps the most sweeping changes to retirement accounts that we've seen in many years, and uh, they happened uh, one right after the other. So lots to review, lots of opportunity, lots of uh, knowledge to uh, to share uh, with respect to both of those. thought it was a good time to re-engage with those, and then we'll uh, talk about the markets, talk about some ideas um, as uh, futures are higher this morning on uh, some commentary over the weekend. Uh, Chairman Powell was on 60 Minutes. And then this morning, uh, one of the vaccine companies, Moderna, came out and said that they had some positive uh, results, uh, and that's uh, fueling uh, optimism this morning. So to back up, I uh, want to get started and talk about uh, the CARES Act and uh, some of the effects that that's going to have on retirement assets and uh, items that uh, we all need to be mindful of as, uh, as we invest uh, money or as we advise others uh, on how to uh, manage their finances. And these can have uh, real long-term implications, uh, so lots of, uh, lots of uh, tools that can be uh, used as levers, which can really leverage uh, potential returns. So first off, uh, reminder that the uh, tax filing deadline has been moved to July 15th. Um, from April 15th, and that IRA and Roth contributions for 2019 need to be made by this date. So, a wonderful opportunity to talk to uh, talk to uh, investors and remind them that they have now until July 15th, especially um, for uh, for Roth contributions for those clients who may have been impacted by uh, by the COVID-19 and their income may be down for 2020. They could still make a 2020 contribution as well. Um, so uh, even if they can't make a 2019 contribution because their income exceeds uh, limits, uh, they can make a 2020 contribution if that is applicable. Also, uh, the CARES Act waived the 10% penalty for 2020 distributions for up to $100,000 taken by individuals under age 59 and a half. Normally, you take money out before you're 59 and a half. 10% penalty, you can now take out $100,000. Um, without that penalty, there are certain conditions which I will, uh, which I will go through. Um, and those distributions can be made from a combination of IRAs and or retirement uh, employer plans. Um, the mandatory withholding from employer plans is also waived, and the taxes related to that distribution are due without penalty, but can be spread over three years, and the funds can also be repaid over a three-year period. Individuals over 59 and a half who are not affected by the penalty can also take advantage of the three-year rule in terms of paying those taxes over three years um, and taking those distributions over three years. So who can take this money out without uh, without penalty? Um, you have to meet one of the following conditions. You have to have been diagnosed with COVID-19, have a spouse or dependent who has been diagnosed. Um, you've experienced adverse financial consequences as a result of being furloughed, laid off, or a reduction in work hours due to the pandemic. You have had uh, the ability to work compromised because you're having to take care of a minor child impacted by the virus, uh, perhaps a, a caregiver at home uh, watching uh, kids who uh, can't uh, go to school, um, or you've owned a business that has been closed because of the pandemic. Also, required minimum distributions waived for 2020. 
By eliminating the need for individuals to take RMDs, the Act enables individuals to reduce their taxable income for 2020. This is a significant tax break because keep in mind that those uh, those RMDs were based on December 31st, 2019 uh, valuations, uh, and uh, the Dow on December 31st, 2019 was 28,538. So those distributions uh, would have been a uh, based on a higher uh, number. Um, without this relief package, IRA owners who are at least 70 and a half years old in 2019 would have been subject to re- required uh, distributions based on that higher amount and the higher associated taxes. If you have already taken an RMD in 2020 um, prior to the pandemic or at the beginning of the pandemic, but uh, now uh, you know that you do not need to take that distribution, um, as long as you haven't taken that distribution from more than one place, um, and uh, it doesn't exceed 60 days, you can take advantage of the 60-day rollover rule and move the money back into an IRA. What about inherited IRAs? Um, for non-designated beneficiaries of an IRA, distributions are required to be made over a five-year period um, following the death of the IRA owner. Um, now, because of this uh, requirement, uh, they are extending that uh, to six years. Um, so, for those individuals who are affected by the five-year rule, the five-year rule is now six years. Um, if you are a beneficiary of an inherited IRA owner um, who already began taking their distributions based on their own life expectancy, um, you can opt out and not take the 2020 RMD, and you can take it in 2021. Now, if you are subject to the new RMD rules, you may remember that uh, inherited IRAs can no longer be taken going forward over the life expectancy, they have to be taken over a 10-year rule, and that 10-year rule states, and this is based on the SECURE Act and not the CARES Act, so this is the SECURE Act that predated the, the CARES Act. Um, you have 10 years if you have an inherited IRA now uh, starting in uh, 2020. Um, you have 10 years to take that distribution. That 10-year period is not affected by the SECURE Act because under the new 10-year rule, you do not have to take any distributions in years one through nine, and you can take the full distribution in year 10 if you would like. Um, so that rule, it does not extend that 10-year period, so you're still subject to the same 10-year rule. Lots of information. Moving on to uh, the financial markets. Um, we are seeing uh, futures uh, moving higher right now. Um, actually, they were moving higher. They were just up over 700 um, futures uh, this morning. Um, Plight Open is up about 600 right now, um, and this is as uh, news from Moderna. Uh, their trial stoked optimism. Moderna is up about 30% pre-market. Um, what they stated was that of their 45 volunteers in their Phase 1 study, that all 45 had developed antibodies to the coronavirus, and uh, that uh, fueling uh, optimism that perhaps they will have uh, success uh, in Phase 2 and 3 and ultimately in a vaccine. Uh, still a long way away, but nevertheless, uh, some optimistic uh, news. Um, also, um, what we're seeing is comments last night. Uh, Fed Chair uh, Powell was on uh, 60 Minutes in an interview that he, uh, that he did actually uh, on Wednesday but was aired last night, and uh, he said that there's a lot more we can do to help the economy um, so for those who are fearful that the Fed was out of ammunition, he says we're not out of, ammu- out of ammunition by a long shot. Um, so that uh, also fueled uh, optimism that uh, if things were to get worse, there's a lot more that the Fed believes it can do. Um, taking a look at other uh, other indices, uh, we're seeing S&P futures up about 70, NASDAQ futures up about 140. Um, taking a look at uh, overseas markets, uh, we are seeing... Uh, Markets in Asia up anywhere between a half and one percent. Um, Europe is up uh, right now on average uh, about three percent uh, across the board. Strongest performer, the German DAX, up three point seven seven percent. Oil continuing to rally. Oil up uh, two seventy eight this morning to thirty two twenty one. That's for uh, Brent oil. Uh, so oil up ten percent uh, this morning. Natural gas is up six and a half percent. Gold is up about three dollars an ounce. Silver, which has been uh, which has been uh, not following uh, gold, um, has been rallying the last few days. And uh, silver this morning is up over three percent. Gold up about two tenths of one percent. So silver continuing its outperformance. Um, dollar is uh, is down slightly against uh, most major currencies. 
and we are seeing uh, we're seeing bond yields slightly higher, but uh, as uh, as the trend continues, uh, bond yields remaining low. Two years at 15 basis points, 10 years at 67, 30 year at 137. So uh, despite uh, the uh, equity market rally, really not seeing a lot of uh, movement in the uh, in the bond market. Also this morning, um, today, the World Health uh, Organization, WHO, is uh, conducting their uh, annual meeting. It's being done uh, remotely, um, and uh, the talk is, uh, is what the relationship is going to be between the U.S. and China at this meeting. Um, there is a talk that the United States is going to uh, request an investigation of China's response to the coronavirus. And uh, there is talk that China will push back uh, very hard on uh, on the U.S.'s position. Uh, so this is something that could lead to uh, it could lead to a friction that could impact the markets as the day um, goes on. Um, there's also uh, ongoing friction between the U.S. and China with respect to Huawei. Uh, this morning, China has urged the U.S. to immediately stop actions against Huawei. Uh, this is after the U.S. said that uh, Huawei would uh, be prohibited from uh, from from using uh, certain U.S. technology. Uh, the Chinese have reacted very vehemently and angrily to that, and uh, there is uh, talk that the Chinese uh, might retaliate against companies like Apple, Qualcomm, Boeing. Um, as a result of that, the Chinese have even hinted at that, so we'll see how that uh, how that uh, tension uh, plays out and uh, if and when it uh, gets resolved, if it gets resolved at all. Um, Texas, a uh, state that's, uh, that has uh, opened up, so being watched carefully. Um, cases there have increased, but the amount of testing has doubled, so um, ABC News is reporting that uh, the increase in testing may be re- a result of the, uh, of the in- in- more cases, maybe the result of more testing, not necessarily a worsening of the situation there, something that some are hoping uh, continues, and therefore... Um, less concerns about uh, reopening as we see more and more states uh, beginning to reopen. Um, with respect to the uh, CARES Act and the uh, PPP, uh, which is uh, one of the programs for uh, small businesses, the Trump administration saying they will revise terms of the small business lending program to allow for more flexibility. That's being reported by the Wall Street Journal. Um, last week, uh, the, on Friday, the House passed a $3 trillion stimulus bill by a vote of 208 to 199, but that bill does not have enough votes to pass the Senate. Um, Wall Street Journal reporting the TSA is preparing to begin temper checks at 12 airports uh, as soon as next week. Um, Reuters reporting that Italy is going to reopen shops and restaurants and hair salons, um, and that's uh, ongoing right now. Um, France had its uh, debt outlook revised to negative from stable um, by Fitch. Um, video game sales in the U.S. Uh, in the first quarter hit a record. Um, Disney in the news this morning. Um, they uh, opened up Disney Springs, their shopping district. Uh, no word yet on when uh, the Walt Disney World uh, Park will open, but uh, some uh, some tentative signs of uh, reopening taking place at Disney. Um, with the word of the vaccine this morning, the uh, largest uh, gainers in general are companies that have been hit hardest by the uh, coronavirus, the hospitality Airline cruise ships, uh, those stocks up uh, in the neighborhood of 5 to 10% this morning. Uh, Barron's over the weekend, uh, in an article talking about what uh, some of the most uh, uh, seasoned hedge funds have been doing in the last week, uh, and Barron's uh, saying that uh, many of these uh, managers have been moving from uh, what uh, some are calling, uh, you know, pandemic stocks, whether it's, uh, you know, Zoom or Amazon. Um, some of the stocks that have uh, that have uh, been able to reposition and uh, benefit during the, this, these horrible times. Um, Barron's reporting that uh, these hedge funds have started moving into some of the companies that uh, will benefit as the economy reopens. Some of the hardest hit companies, uh, and Barron suggesting a rotation is underway among some of the uh, savviest managers. Um, also, uh, over the weekend, and uh, this is almost a footnote at this point, uh, but just interesting uh, how uh, how things are playing out in the retail world. Uh, J.C. Penney follows a voluntary petition for reorganization under Chapter 11, something that's been going south for a long time, but uh, now uh, we have uh, the uh, finality there. What do we have to look forward to this week? Uh, I mentioned the uh, WHO uh, is holding its 73rd World Health Assembly, um, and it's a two-day meeting, and that is ongoing. Um, today we have uh, Baidu, the uh, Chinese uh, search engine company, reporting its first quarter results. Tomorrow we get earnings from uh, Home Depot and Walmart. 
Um, we also get uh, new residential construction data for April. Um, Wednesday, we get some more earnings. We get Take Two Interactive, uh, Video Game Maker, Expedia in the uh, in the travel space, uh, Lowe's, the home retailer, uh, McKesson and Target reporting earnings. Also, we get uh, the Federal Open Market Committee releasing the minutes from its monetary policy meeting in late April. Thursday, we get some more earnings. Companies like Medtronic, NVIDIA, uh, TJ Maxx. We get leading economic indicators for April. Those aren't expected to look too good. Also not expecting to look too good on uh, Thursday is the uh, Purchasing Managers Index for May, um, and that's expected to uh, to come in at 34.3, um, which is well below expansionary, and again, not surprising, which would be uh, 50. And then Friday, we get the earnings from uh, the Chinese e-commerce company Alibaba and uh, the U.S. company John Deere, um, all reporting earnings on Friday. Moving on to Barron's, uh, Barron's, uh, you know, talking about uh, U.S.-China trade tensions, um, saying that we're just starting to emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. Now tensions are flaring again, um, so they're uh, cautiously optimistic with uh, the good news about the U.S. economy that we're starting to reopen, and sort of the good news is that uh, the bad news can't really get much worse, given how bad the bad news is. Um, retail sales uh, down uh, significantly. We got that news last month. Um, but uh, Barron's expressing a lot of concern um, at this time when uh, when the economy is uh, particularly sensitive, uh, a lot different than when the U.S. and China uh, were engaged in, uh, in in trade tensions, uh, you know, six to twelve months ago when the U.S. economy was uh, was very strong. Um, now, with the economy weak, trade tensions uh, can have uh, much more uh, harmful effects. Um, some economists. Uh, Drawing parallels to uh, the 1930s, when uh, when we had a weak economy and lots of trade tensions with uh, trading partners and contributing to the Great Depression, so concerns that uh, that the uh, trade tensions are flaring at this uh, sensitive time, and something that uh, the Barons feels uh, bears uh, a lot of attention from investors uh, to see how uh, how these tensions uh, ultimately uh, ultimately resolve or don't resolve themselves. So Barron's talked about the headline story, which was uh, which was uh, the race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, um, something lots of investors are uh, are focused on from a financial standpoint, and of course all of humanity is focused on it from uh, from a uh, from a human uh, benefit uh, standpoint. Um, and uh, Barron's uh, talking about uh, Moderna as well as some of the other uh, companies. Moderna certainly the, uh, the the stock in the news today. Um, one of the things that Barron's talks about uh, after you know, discussing with uh, lots of scientists is the complexity of developing a vaccine, and um, very often there, uh, you know, there there are good signs that a vaccine is uh, is 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 having positive uh, positive results, and uh, and yet uh, implementation uh, becomes problematic. Hopefully, that's not the case here. And the Barons went through the vaccines. There are a hundred different uh, programs underway to develop a COVID nineteen vaccine. Uh, most will fare fail. Um, for now, it's too early for investors to pick winners and losers among the programs. Um, we have many of the major players, including GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, um, Pfizer, um, and, and some of the uh, upstarts like Moderna, Novavax, and Invivo, all, uh, all amongst the uh, most promising candidates. Um, some companies like Glaxo, J and J, and AstraZeneca said they will not seek any profit on the COVID vaccine during the pandemic. Um, but nevertheless, still lots of uh, financial benefit from uh, from from being the uh, company that uh, that is able to successfully uh, produce a vaccine um, because the vaccine business, in all likelihood, will be a business uh, that uh, continues to uh, grow and flourish uh, even uh, after hopefully. Um, there is a, uh, a vaccine for COVID-19. And what Barron's did was they explained the science behind the vaccines, and they broke the uh, vaccine candidates into two groups. They call them the hares and the tortoises. Um, the hares are the companies that are uh, exploring uh, new technologies that could result in uh, vaccine development uh, very quickly. Um, and then the tortoises are the companies that are uh, that are that are pursuing uh, more traditional vaccine development. Um, and those uh, vaccines will probably take somewhere between 18 and 24 months to reach market. So the hope is that the hares uh, are able to come up with a successful vaccine based on new technology. 
If not, the tortoises are waiting in the wings with the sort of more uh, tried and true technology. Doesn't mean that either of them will be successful. Um, but uh, nevertheless, if uh, step one is not successful, there are companies uh, in step two in the tortoises. So who are the hares? Um, the hares are Pfizer and Moderna, which are pursuing a, uh, a technology based on uh, on messenger RNA. Um, and uh, Pfizer and Moderna are hoping that uh, if they have success, that they could have some vaccines uh, available um, by uh, by the fall. Um, the hares are companies that are using the more traditional uh, approach to uh, vaccine development, and the hares are companies like uh, like Sanofi and GlaxoSmithKline who have been uh, pursuing vaccines for uh, for a long period of time. Um, also in the uh, hair category is uh, Novavax and in, in, in Ovio Pharmaceuticals. Um, they're probably hairs that are a little bit, or a hair, no pun intended, uh, behind in terms of development, uh, uh, Pfizer and uh, Moderna. Uh, Pfizer does work with BioNTech, symbol BNTX, on their vaccine. So, uh, so uh, Pfizer is working in collaboration with BNTX. Um, and then uh, a company that's kind of straddling uh, the hares and the tortoises with a technology that's kind of in between, they hope to have a vaccine by year end, is uh, Johnson & Johnson. So we wish them all uh, success and, uh, and hope we have lots of uh, companies with successful uh, vaccines. Moving on to uh, some other, uh, other stories. Um, Barron's uh, wrote a story talking about uh, cable TV and, uh, and streaming, and uh, they highlighted uh, Viacom CBS, symbol V-I-A-C, as a company that, uh, that may uh, be a beneficiary of, uh, of some of their initiatives, um, despite the fact that uh, cord cutting is, uh, is gaining, uh, gaining momentum here even uh, during the uh, pandemic as uh, more and more people choose to get their, uh, their television from, uh, from streaming services. So you think that would be bad news for CBS Viacom, um, but uh, but they point out uh, that CBS Viacom shares jumped 20% uh, o- over two days last week after they reported first quarter results, um, and they pointed out that the ratings are decent, but uh, investors don't seem to care about ratings uh, right now on the uh, traditional uh, platform. Uh, CBS has been the most watched TV network for 12 straight years. It merged with Viacom, which has Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, MTV, and uh, and BET, BET. Um, but nevertheless, uh, what uh, investors are really pinning their hopes on with uh, with Viacom CBS is their streaming services. So uh, Viacom CBS announced that they hit 13.5 million paid streaming subscribers in the first quarter. That's up 50% from a year earlier. That includes CBS All Access and Showtime. Um, but perhaps uh, even more exciting to investors was that they uh, they announced uh, numbers for Pluto TV, um, which they own, which is free and makes money on advertising. And their average users jump 55% to 24 million uh, viewers. So while those numbers uh, may fall well short of uh, the numbers at Netflix, which uh, has about 180 million subscribers, or Disney with 90 million subscribers, um, CBS Viacom starting to uh, demonstrate that their services uh, can gain traction and can start uh, being uh, competitive with uh, the more entrenched services. And then that brings uh, the analysts to the next question or the next uh, factor is, uh, well, what does this look like uh, from a valuation standpoint? Um, well, Netflix is valued at about $190 billion by stock market capitalization, um, CBS Viacom has about $11 billion stock market capitalization, um, and that's despite the fact that Viacom CBS has $25 billion in revenue and uh, Netflix has about $24 billion in revenue, so CBS Viacom about a billion more in revenue. Um, Netflix, uh, which is still in its early days and uh, not profitable um, um, on gap measures, um, is still burning through about a billion dollars in cash. They're expected to be free cash flow positive in 2023. Um, but uh, Viacom CBS, uh, even in the midst of a uh, advertising slump this year, is expected to generate about 1.4 billion in positive uh, free cash flow. Um, there are still plenty of challenges that do remain for Viacom CBS. It has uh, 18 billion in long-term debt. They still pay a heavy dividend. Stock yields about 5.7%. 
um, and that doesn't leave a lot of room for things to go wrong. Long term, however, making money isn't CBS Viacom's problem. Its problem is that stock investors view TV as a dying business. If the pandemic continues to spur faster streaming growth, it might help the company win over um, some fans on Wall Street. One last article, and I'm going to turn things over to uh, Brad. Something to uh, think about uh, in this environment here is, uh, is, is companies that pay a dividend. So um, if uh, markets remain rocky, um, what companies uh, will pay you while you wait? So Barron's uh, took a look at eight dividend stocks uh, that uh, that they think uh, split the difference between uh, yield and safety. So companies that pay at least 2%. And companies that they believe uh, can continue to grow their dividends even in a you know challenging economic uh, environment. Uh, they culled their list by uh, by looking at uh, at two funds um, that uh, that that invest in companies with reliable dividend growth: uh, the Vanguard Dividend Appreciation Fund and the Wisdom Tree U.S. Quality Dividend Growth Fund. And then they culled the list down from there. Um, based on several other criteria, including uh, companies that have a dividend yield of at least two percent, and uh, look like they can maintain that uh, that dividend and grow it. So on this list, uh, companies like Verizon with a four point four percent dividend yield, Procter and Gamble two point eight, J and J two point seven, Comcast at two point six, Merck's yielding three point two, McDonald's two point eight, Pepsi three point one, and uh, Medtronic yielding 2.3%. That's uh, everything that I've got. I'm going to turn it over to Brad. Good morning, Brad. Morning, Keith. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone had a great weekend. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief this morning. Uh, I'm sounding like a broken record what I'm saying every week, but what I'm saying is really uh, it's, it's, it's the reality. Uh, so I'm going to stay with the theme of the correlation between municipals and equities. The reason I keep beating this drum is because this has just become an absolute confidence game. Uh, there, there really are depleting tax revenues, a depleting tax base, income tax down, sales taxes down, uh, more than likely property taxes uh, will go down. So similar to equities, uh, we are now playing the futures game in municipals. Every time the equity market does better, it is a, it's a vote of confidence for the economy. Uh, a vote of confidence for the economy uh, makes all spread bond markets, whether it's corporates or municipals, uh, behave better. Uh, a couple of other things that are taking place on the municipal end. The Fed is still working on an, on an emergency lending program for, for states and local governments, which is uh, obviously very important for the liquidity of, of our market. And uh, ultimately, uh, what we're all going to be looking for, all the municipal professionals are looking to see what the federal government is ultimately going to do uh, to help bail out the states. Uh, the deficits are, are tremendous. Many of them are COVID-related. And I think ultimately what will happen is there will be a bailout for COVID-related uh, losses. Uh, but the states and authorities that have been managed poorly before the crisis happened uh, are going to be in trouble, probably more trouble than they were before this all happened. Uh, the municipal market has lost all correlation to treasuries. Uh, the, the municipal market is completely headline dependent. So every time you see a positive headline, uh, we catch a bid in our market, and we start to see that more and more last week. Uh, and, and the last thing I just want to say is, I, and uh, many of you are reviewing your portfolios, uh, trying to upgrade, trying to stay away from uh, certain municipals that are on, on credit watch or negative watch. And I think that it's a good idea to keep reviewing the portfolios and make sure that you are comfortable uh, with where they are at the moment in in not only municipals, but everything for that matter. So I hope everyone has a good week. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. That's everything I've got. Thank you for listening to Mr. Keith Lanton. For more podcasts, please visit our website, www.lanternwa.com.